then for the most part, being good at something is the result of um, hours upon hours of practice and learning. Uh, in choosing a career, I sort of look at it as you're almost making the decision about what to become good at rather than the other way around. So how then do you find a career you love? So the slogan for my campaign to you is do something valuable. Let the problems in the world dictate what you do rather than forcing a preconceived checklist labeled success to be your motivation. Do something that genuinely helps others and makes the world a better place in some way, no matter how small. Uh, I think that's the, the way to have a happy, fulfilled life. So when I tell people this, half think it's crazy and half think it's trivial. I think it's neither, actually. So here's a, a little three-part explanation. First, we have the intuition. Think about yourself at uh, 85, sitting on a rocking chair, looking back on your life. Version one of you might think, OK, well, I made a ton of cash. I own three beach houses and a yacht. But what was the point of it all? Compare with version two of you. I made a lot of money, but I also dewormed the entire childhood population of Burundi. But what was the point of it all? We find it pretty easy to imagine version one of you, but the thought of version two of you being dissatisfied is pretty jarring. So if you want lasting satisfaction, you should do something you find meaningful. And the best way to do something you find meaningful is to do something that actually is meaningful. Second, I'll give you the science behind it. Acting altruistically makes you happier and healthier. A study found that uh, people who volunteer for good causes report higher levels of happiness and health than those who don't volunteer. The authors uh, suggested that volunteering gives a sense of uh, perspective so that when you judge how well your life is going, you're aware of people who are less privileged than you are, as well as people who are better off than you. And it's been found that one of the most important factors in job satisfaction is how much your work affects the well-being of others. So feeling that you're making a difference makes it easier to get into the state of flow. And the greater the significance you attribute to your work, the higher your performance. Finally, I could speak from personal experience I used to study so much to get good grades and work because I wanted to be the best, but now I work because I want to help others. This improved my life in many ways. I now have a, a deeper sense of uh, meaning and completeness. I know I'm living up to my own values rather than following the crowd. And I feel like a tremendous clarity and resolution of purpose. So there's no messing around trying to find out the true me. That doesn't exist. In contrast, the problems in the world are real and concrete. So I never doubt my aims now. Altruism is the one thing you can do that you know you won't regret. When it comes to self-interest, everyone is competing for the same things, money, fame, power, status. So if you want anything, you have to fight everyone else for it. But when it comes to altruism, there's no competition. Everyone wants the same thing, namely to make people better off. So it's much easier to be wildly successful as an altruist because you'll find other people supporting you at every step. So does that mean you should drop everything and work for Oxfam? Not necessarily. What it does mean is that you should start finding out what's valuable and get help working out the ways in which your career choice could make for a better world. Five years after graduating with a bachelor's in AXI, Two years after getting a master's in statistics and now pursuing a PhD in statistics, it's fun to remember how it all started, I guess, how I made it into the stats world. I enjoyed math and was looking for some fun way to use numbers in my eventual career. So with that premise in mind, I began researching and the different careers available to me. Engineering and medicine never seemed appealing at the onset. So I wanted to try something more diverse and broad. Economics looked cool, but it wasn't mathsy enough. So in the midst of this research, I heard about actuarial science. So I decided to give it a try. And along the way, I realized that statistics was actually what uh, I envisioned. 
a chance to apply deep numeric analysis to almost any field you could think of. Statistics are everywhere, uh, which is what I love most about what I do. It is inspiring to learn about new research methods and models where statistics are used in exciting and somewhat surprising new ways. I realized that I could use my knowledge in statistics to work on, say, industry-related topics, psychological research, or practically anything you could think of. I could work in the agri-industry or for a pharmaceutical company. Almost any question in a firm, political party, or a researcher has could be solved with stats, and a statistician could answer them. You never get bored as a statistician. If modeling starts to become burdensome for you, uh, you could simply change fields. For instance, a lot of the side projects I work on with uh, medical doctors, but I also get a chance to collaborate with other individuals to develop analyses, say in livestock research, nutrition, and well, of course, education. Now teaching these theories and applications to some of you even so far. And this allows me a change of pace for a while and it ensures that I'm not stuck doing the same thing over and over, and few careers offer that much flexibility. Another thing I love about my job, which is something not many statisticians talk about, is that in this career, you get to give it your personal touch to everything that you do. Consider statistics is, is a career with uh, no absolutes. By this, I mean there, there aren't any necessarily a right or wrong solution. It's fairly common to have two different approaches to the same problem, two different models, two different outputs, many more actually. And once you become experienced, the software you use, the decisions you make and the methodologies you employ will allow you to produce some very original analyses, something truly yours, to the joy of feeling you created something unique uh, when your job is complete, it can't be overstated. So all this is why I have some important advice for anyone considering a career path in statistics. Just do it. And that piece of advice was sponsored by Nike. So I can't stress enough how, how fun and diverse it is to work in this field, but, but beware, it's not easy. Uh, you really need a solid background to be a good statistician. And these days it's becoming more and more important to have good programming skills, which in all honesty, I'm still working on. You have to be humble and always be ready to learn from someone else. You, know, you have Dr. Dial Singh, Mr. Mohammed, Dr. Antoine. I would always chat with them because right here in the department, you can learn so much. It's great to collaborate with other statisticians who bring their own vision and ideas. And being a statistician is truly a collaborative endeavor. And you learn about many different topics and fields. A few years back, I was lucky enough to learn a bit about um, the process of predicting football match results, and then developing a new estimator of the mean and sampling theory. And these are just two of the topics I worked on during the MSc. I could talk more about the many job opportunities statisticians have, or how it's considered amongst the fastest growing and most profitable careers. But your career choice should be based on what you feel can make a difference, on what you dream about and find valuable. So what you must really know is that by joining this profession, you'll be entering one of the most rewarding and exciting fields there is, should you choose to do so. Many of us fall into the trap of uh, doing these stereotypical things, which are expected of us as students, but that's where you need to stop and realize that this university experience is not what others expect you to make of it, but what you choose to make of it. For me, the university experience is all about uh, discovering and trying new things, as well as mixing with people from diverse backgrounds and thereby you could broaden your horizons. I believe it would be better to feel at doing something challenging, something worthwhile, and something I'm excited to show the world than to succeed doing something safe, something that won't really inspire much at all. So you can learn with the experience that uh, some fear is good, not all, but just some. But when the fear comes from a place of wanting to follow through, something you believe in is good. So when it comes to your future experiences, as you enter the world with your knowledge and excitement, as you choose opportunities, always remember, if you aren't scared, well, be worried. 
Well, hopefully I haven't bored you with this little uh, TED talk, I guess. But I'll leave you with a quote from the great man himself, Arsene Wenger. If you don't believe you could do it, then you have no chance at all. So thank you all for having me and listening. I'd be happy to answer questions if any, and well, if time permits. Okay. Hi, good day, you guys. So we will be heading into the uh, Q&A segment. And as Mr. Bagwandin said, sir, you really give a, a TED talk. I really thought I was watching a TED talk <laughs> on YouTube um, for a while. Um, what you, I didn't expect you to say this stuff, honestly. Is that good or bad? It's good. It's good. It, it it gives a different view of you know not going down the same path as the world wants you to go down. Right. Uh, you did say um, to do something um, valuable and to do something meaningful. So I think everyone here could um, you can think about that when you guys um, choose whether or not you want to um, be actuary or not. Uh, so I think I will start off with a, a question now. Um, so when I remember talking to you during a statistics class and I asked you what your degree was and you said actors, um, actuarial science. And I was so surprised because you, you, want, you wasn't an actuary. Um, so in what, at what point um, in your life did you realize? that this actuarial science journey isn't for me. Okay, so I believe it would have been at the end of uh, year two. Mr. Smart, he, he got internships for, for some of us. And I think after the internship, like it was a really fruitful experience. I enjoyed it. But I sort of realized, okay, this isn't really what I want to do for how many ever years. So along the way, I guess the, the statistics, that component of um, the degree so far, it sort of got to me. So I realized, okay, well, if I don't plan on actually continuing with this actuarial science career path, let me at least do what I need to do in order to get on the path for statistics. So I decided to do stats electives. And yet, three. So those would have been the qualifying courses to do the masters. But okay. at the end of the day, it was a learning experience. And I mean, I don't know if I would change the decision, but the degree itself it provided me with a bit of everything. You learned a bit of finance, a bit of programming. You have your math, you have your stats. So it was pretty diverse, but it just wasn't for me, I guess. And yeah, I could have switched along the way, but I'm the type of person, okay, I started with it. I want to finish it. So I finished it. I will, not only that, but scholarships at the time give you quite a bit of headache to switch degrees. Okay. That's very um, insightful. Um, also, um, were there any, did you feel the pressure to keep going um, into the actual time? You, even though you didn't want to do it anymore, like pressure from your your colleagues and your friends and your family, like you know, do you feel any pressure? And what advice would you give someone who who, who don't want to do actual science anymore, but you know the parents don't really agree with it just yet? Okay, well, in that regard, um, pressure from friends and colleagues, I wouldn't say so. I mean, yeah, they would always ask, so you're going to write the exams, you're going to write the exams. And maybe in hindsight, I should have just tried one of the exams, but I guess that door is still open, but no pressure really from them. Uh, because at the end of the day, a lot of them didn't end up writing the exams either. Uh, in terms of family, so this might sound a bit weird, but <laughs> I completed two degrees, AXI and STATS, and I don't think my family even knew what degree I did. <laughs> so... <laughs> I wouldn't say there was any pressure from them. They just said, you know, 
you don't want to do medicine, you don't want to do engineering, you like maths, you do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, you know, I'll do that. Uh, in terms of advice for someone who doesn't want to continue, but their parents are pressuring them, I guess you just need to let them see your perspective because at the end of the day, this is your life, your eventual career path. And it doesn't make sense to, you know, struggle throughout the degree. And then at the end, you can't get a, a job because of the fact that you struggle throughout the degree. You didn't enjoy the, um, the content or whatever it might have been. So you just need to let them see your perspective and show them what you actually are passionate about and what you really want to pursue. And I'm pretty sure they would understand. Okay, thank you for, for that, you guys. Um, I have one question for um, from someone. Uh, sorry, apparently my mic wasn't on properly. So sorry for that. Um, so someone asks, um, what about the internship um, made you realize that it wasn't for you? Um, I guess it, it didn't. Most of it was financial related stuff. And I guess when it comes to the financial aspect of things, I'm not really fascinated by that, like by those things. So I guess right there I realized, okay, yeah, this probably isn't for me. And maybe I should have researched that a bit more earlier on, but I just realized, okay, well, this is something new and upcoming. Let me just try it. So I, it was my fault that from the, the onset, but at the end of the day, it's just really what I felt comfortable doing and what I enjoyed. Don't get me wrong, the degree was was great. Mr. Smart, Mr. Doctor, all of them. The experience was great. Getting to interact with all of them, but you just need to get a feel for what you actually want to do. And I guess that's, that's what I actually wanted to do in the end. Okay. Well, um, is there any other question that you guys may have in the audience? Don't be afraid to ask you guys. Good day, sir. Hi, good day. I have a question for you. Sure. How was the transition from actuarial science to statistics? Was it a difficult transition and what steps did you take in order to transition to this field? Okay, so in terms of a transition, because a lot of the, the courses were already, you know, pretty much based on statistics, like the intro to actuarial math, uh, risk, theory, which I believe is loss models now, since it already contained a lot of stats and I had decided to do stats electives, it wasn't really that difficult of a transition. Uh, in terms of steps, uh, I guess what I used to do, I would harass the stats lecturers a lot and well, they could tell you that. I wouldn't have been too vocal in class. I mean, I would get my work done and whatnot. Like we sort of had that mental understanding okay if they gave us something to do and they looked across and i would just sort of mouth my answer and they would just kind of give you that nod so we kind of had that understanding but i would always harass them after class during office hours you know just ask a bunch of questions you know should i do this should i do that what can i do with this what can i do with that and i guess their advice sort of helped a lot and being able to prepare me as to what I need exactly to focus on if I truly want to, you know, propel in terms of statistics. Okay, thank you.
Okay, sorry about that long pause. Um, Zalina is having some technical difficulties. So, um, does anyone have any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Babu and me. That was an amazing bunch of information. It was like, literally, like Zalin said, a, a TED talk, and I got a lot from that. So, thank you. No problem. <laughs> I will. I will. around if you all need to talk in any. Yes. Okay, thanks um, for having me. Yes. Um, up next, we have Shane Musai. He's the founder of this club, and Shane graduated in 2016 and is currently pursuing a PhD in economics. So, Shane. Um, okay, so Shane is having a bit of technical difficulties, so um, let's wait a moment while he rejoins. Um, hear me? Yes, we're hearing you now. Okay, perfect. So I prepared a presentation this morning. <laughs> um, hopefully the pictures and flashes will make it look nice and we'll focus less on certain things and one certain things. OK, so um, I was asked to present on life after UV and life during my actual science degree as well. So I decided to do it in a chronological order um, before UV, during UV and after UV. So right, this is the structure of the presentation. It's a, a, a relatively short presentation. So before UV, during my days at Queensborough College, from form one to form six, I had no idea what actual science was like. I had like literally no idea that it even existed. Um, I studied all science subjects back then because my goal back then was to be an astronaut. I always just wanted to be an astronaut. I, I believe, you know, it'd be so cool to be out of this world, literally. Um, and then one day my PO maths teacher in form six and in, in upper six, he said that he studied actuarial science. And at that time I was like, wait, you teach me PO maths and you studied actuarial science. What is actuarial science about? And I started Googling it and um, doing my own research. And then I realized this might be something I want to do. So when I was applying to UE, actuarial science was one of my choices. 
And the more research I did, and I, I did in doctoral science, the more I wanted to be an actuary. So year one, so this is days during my actuarial science degree. Year one, this was the easiest of the two years, and I'm sure most of you who probably in year two by now would realize how nice year one was, you know, because by the time year two start and you have these actuarial courses and you see how difficult they are, you would miss being back in year one. And I think year one was the only time I've, I've ever been in the Dean's Honor Roll. After that, it seems so impossible, you know. <laughs> um, so year two is where the difficulty starts. And during my second year, I heard about the student exchange program. Basically, I was walking down the path by LLC Greens there, and I saw they had this tent, and I decided to, to be fast and see what was this about. And um, it was the um, people from the international office and student admin. They had a little booth there, and they were talking about the student exchange program. And then I considered, is it possible to go on exchange? And um, would it be expensive? So. I decided to sign up and I was luckily lucky enough to be accepted into, into the University of Waterloo for the student exchange program. And for those of you in the actual science degree, you can go um, on exchange to the, to the University of Waterloo or to the University of Toronto or any um, university that offers actual science that is part of this exchange program. I think it's, it's a list of 150 um, universities and all. Now, at Waterloo, it was 90% Chinese, right? And, and the actual science courses was 90% Chinese. My expectation before going to Waterloo would be like, you know, it, it would have people who could communicate English and, you know, make a lot of friends in class, but that was not the case. Being 90% Chinese, they spoke to each other in Chinese. And so to make a friend who would be in the actual class would be very difficult compared to if he was doing it in UWE. So that was one um, difficulty there. But I made a lot of friends in the different clubs and organizations. So there's a Caribbean club, there was a dance club, um, there was a U the University of Waterloo Axai Club. And you can see from this little card here, I had my own UW Axai Club card. <laughs> and I think the Axai Club and at the University of Waterloo really inspired me to, um, to start the UB Actuarial Science Club in Trinidad when I came back, because I saw the benefit that their students um, had from that club. Um, they would rent the actuarial manuals, they would have all these seminars with actuaries coming in and they had a mentorship program. There was so much opportunity from that club that made me realize that we really need to have that club back at UWE in Trinidad. So when I came back, we started the actuarial science club, me and a team of my friends at the time. Um, and here I have a video of one of the events they had. Um, it was a actuarial seminar and jazz concert with Professor Sam Boverman, right? If I have time at the end, I'll come back and play this video. It's about three minutes long, but it is one of my favorite um, scenes for my undergrad degree. So I'll come back and play this if I have time at the end. So life after you. So after my actual science degree, um, you know, you, you might think that I completely had nothing to do with UV anymore, but that's not the case. I was still at UV because I had to complete um, one year of the AP program because I was on scholarship. So you have that requirement by the government to work for a year for the government. And I was assigned to the um, Department of Mathematics and Statistics. So the first year after my actual science degree, I worked there as an AP. But at that time, I also realized that there wasn't many employers who was hiring people into actuarial related positions. So if you go out fresh into the, into the workplace, you have zero experience, but you have actual science degree they might most likely put you into an accounting department or some finance department within a firm, but there are very few actuarial positions that you could be placed in, um, especially if you're outside of the central bank or, um, or insurance industry. So at that point, I decided maybe I should branch out. And I saw that there was this MSc in financial economics. And I thought, you know, if I do an MSc in financial economics, then I could say I have postgrad qualifications in finance and economics. I cover like two whole fields there with one MSc. <laughs> so at that point, I decided, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do an MSc in financial economics instead of doing the actuarial exams. Um, so that so that it could be more broad. And I say possibly after this MSc, maybe um if I have the time at that point, maybe I could then do the actuarial exams. So um, but while I was working as an AP, I saved up the money to cover the cost of the exam because the MSc in financial economics was probably one of the most expensive MSCs at UV in the, in, in the Faculty of Social Sciences and probably even FSD because the MSc was 35,000 
right? So it was, it was very expensive. Um, and UV only offered scholarship for MPhil and PhD. So all internal UV scholarships are research related scholarships. But at FST, at some point I was working along FST and I saw Mr. Doctor and he was talking to me about um, what I'm doing now and so on. So I told him that I was doing the MSc in financial economics. And he told me that um, the central bank and Deliveroo, they offer a, a scholarship for economic students and maybe it might extend um, to, to the reach of financial economics. So I decided to look at it, look, look into that. And it was true. So the Deliveroo, so there's something called the Deliveroo Scholarship. And I, I, I decided to put this slide here so that those of you who decide to do a MSc in statistics after or finance or economics, even financial economics, or anything within these 12 areas here, you can apply for the Deliveroo Scholarship because um, there are very few scholarships for MSCs. Um, so this is one of the very few. So you could apply for this if you decide after your actual science degree, if you want to do a master's in, st in statistics. Um, so I applied and I was lucky enough to win the, uh, one of the Deliveroo scholarships. There was two awarded that year. So um, one was awarded to me, the other was awarded to a girl named Zwiener. She studied law. And among those who received the Deliveroo scholarship, both in Trinidad and across the Caribbean, the, um, the Deliveroo company itself. So Deliveroo, they print our banknotes. They're the largest currency manufacturer in the world. Right? Imagine they print the banknotes for India, and India is a thousand times the size of Trinidad. So just imagine how much banknotes they print. It's quite a lot. And Delaru, out of the pool of scholars, they, every year they choose two scholars to go on an internship at Delaru so that we see how they operate, how they print the currency, the research they do into the security features they add onto the currency and so on. And I applied. And I was lucky enough to receive that internship at Deliveroo in the United Kingdom. So they paid for everything, so there's nothing I had to worry about. So this was right after I finished my MSc. I um I won that I, I won the opportunity to go on the internship at Deliveroo. And while um well before I went, I actually before I left Trinidad to go there, they were they emailed me the research topic that I'll be working on when I go there. And the research topic was the impact of fintech on the demand for cash with an overview of cybercrime risk. And I, at that point, was like, what the hell is FinTech? FinTech? I, I didn't know what, what that word was. So again, I went to Google, and I started Google and Google and Google and, and, and do a lot of research into this word called FinTech, which is essentially a, a short way of saying financial technology. And I realized how important it is and why a company like Deliveroo would want to do research into FinTech, because now we have all these digital ways of paying. You could pay with your phone, Google Pay, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay. Um, in Trinidad, there are a new fintech companies such as WePay and ShorePay. And around the world, fintech is literally taken over the market, right? In terms of payment, especially where currency is concerned. And what they will realize is that um, countries such as India, countries such as Sweden, they are demanding less and less currency every year. And obviously, if you are a currency manufacturer, you'd be concerned. Why? Um, because th this is where you get your sales. So essentially for them, currency is their sales, right? So they would want to do research to see the impact FinTech has on the demand for cash so that they could probably um, forecast it into the future and make better um, business decisions, right? So there, why did it give me that, um, that insight into where my future is going to be? That whole area of FinTech. Um, the top left-hand photo here would be the office at Deliveroo. The top right-hand photo, that guy with, with the slight pot belly, um, he is actually market analyst at Deliveroo. And this girl down here, where we went um, berry picking in, a, in a, a farm in England, she is actually one of the artists at Deliveroo. So basically, when the central bank sends their banknotes to Deliveroo and say, well, we want this layout, Deliveroo, they would um, go back and forth with the central bank and say what they can do, what they cannot do. And before the final banknote is printed, the artist, so there's a team of artists, and she was one of them who work on our currency. The team of artists did then replicate the design, but um, they etch it on, on certain plates and then upload it onto, um, I think they use some software, I'm not sure the exact name of it, but she's one of the artists who would work on that. But and I, I just put this slide here because most of you probably won't ever have the opportunity to see this. Um, this is the currency in Australia. And well, you know, uh, well, this is a polymer currency, right? 
One of them is fake and one of them is a counterfeit. So this was sent back to Jadilu after people in, in Australia, the Central Bank of Australia, realized people were counterfeiting their currency. Can you spot, could anybody spot the, um, which one is fake and which one is real? If you could just put on your mic and, and, and let me know. Could anybody spot or guess which one is fake and which one is real? The one on top is fake. The bottom one's fake. Okay, so one side one on top, one side one on bottom. Anyone else? Actually, the one, one, the one on top. top. Right. So the one at the bottom is actually fake. The one on yeah. top is the real currency. Um, so if you look within this little window here, there was a 50 that's supposed to be imprinted here. And the one at the bottom, there's no imprint um, into this the window here. The clear window in the Palomar banknotes. So Trinidad and Tobago, we are moving to Palomar um, currency in a, in a few days, because I think November it's supposed to be released to the public. All our currency will be replaced to Palomar. And people have this notion that Palomar is impossible to counterfeit. And that's clearly not true, because we have evidence here, which came back to, um, to Delu. So it's, it, it's more difficult to counterfeit Palomar, but it's not impossible. So you still have to be cautious when you're handling currency and, and spot where, um, where, where it could be counterfeit or not. Because if you happen to use a counterfeit currency, even though it's by mistake, so somebody might hand you the currency and you might use it by mistake without knowing it's counterfeit, you can still be charged because you were the one who used it. So you have to be very careful um, with where currency is concerned. The one on top, um, so the one on top is, is a real currency and the one on bottom is a fake one. All right, so after my internship at Delu, when I came back, again, part of the whole Delu scholarship, I had to do an internship at the Central Bank. Or Trinidad and Tobago. And luckily, I was placed in the payment system oversight division. So, there I helped with, with um, research into their e money policy and their new fintech policy. So, so, the central bank has a fintech policy, which is supposed to guide basically fintech firms on what they can do and what they cannot do in Trinidad and Tobago currently. Right? And they plan for the future to have a payment system acts which incorporate all of this. But that's probably next five, 10 years into the future. So, it's still in the, in the development stage. I helped with that as well. But this, so, but why? So while I was at the Central Bank and knowing what I knew from Delu, I realized that there was a gap in the market for fintech experts, especially in the area of policy making and regulation. I remember that the Central Bank, they reached out to the World Bank and to the IMF for expert advice on fintech regulation. And at the time, the, both the World Bank and IMF, they, um, they said that there was no one that, that they could have spared because of all the development um, around the world in fintech, they needed all the experts that they had. And there are very few people who you could consider experts in fintech because you need to both be an expert into the technology, um, especially where you're talking about blockchain technology, digital ledger technology, um, mobile security, um, digital payments, and you still need to be an expert into the economics and finance part of it. So there are very few people around the world who could do both. Right? So because that highlighted that gap, it brought me here. So after my MSc and after the, those internships, I applied to do a PhD in economics, where my research area would be the impact of fintech on cybercrime, payment methods, and how it can be regulated. Because I think if I do a PhD in this area, um, I would be marketable in that there, there would be a demand from any central bank um, or even banks, where which will now have to be regulated if they offer fintech technologies. So be, to, to, so to basically try to make myself more marketable, I decided to do this research area. Um, so that's where I am currently. And that's the whole inspiration as to why I chose this part. And for those who probably knew me from before, I've always loved technology. Technology, I actually have a YouTube um, channel called Musai Tech where I review technology. So technology is very close to my heart. And well, that's the end of my relatively short presentation. <laughs> is there any questions? Any questions? Um, okay, so thank you so much for that presentation. That was really insightful. I have two questions. Yeah. So um, why did you decide not to pursue the SOA exams? Like what was that, like what made that decision possible? Right. Um, I think why, well, so after, after I finished my degree, I, I mentioned probably before, I was searching for jobs and I realized there was very few jobs that would have put me into actual position. 
And I realized even if I do get an actual position, I might be um, limited into into do, like I, I plan to stay in Trinidad for a number of years, probably build enough experience here before I move away. So in Trinidad, I, I, I think um, there was very few positions I, I could have been in unless I complete the exams first. But to complete the exams, they would have take probably like probably five to, to nine years to do to do all those exams. And I thought it might have been shorter to do an MSc and a PhD. Yeah. OK, and um, my second question is what made you like, what do you think made your scholarship application stand out that like made you win the scholarship? Basically? Yeah, I, I think that's a very important question because I forget to mention it before and I probably should have mentioned it. De La Rue scholarship, they look particularly for um, for leadership roles and your volunteer work. And it so happened that I had several leadership experience, from, especially in undergrad, because I was, um, well, the experience with the actual science club and, and other clubs at UWE. Also, I used to do a lot of volunteer work at the time. I used to volunteer with this organization called Sewer TT. I used to volunteer with um, HSC and several other organizations, like do beach cleanup, help with blood drives, and so on. So I could have talked about it. I even volunteered at this place in Lavantel called Kind, Kids in Need of Development. So I could have talked about it during that um, interview for the scholarship and they they liked what I had to say about it. <laughs> also, I probably should mention that even though I did my undergrad degree in actuarial science and now I'm doing a PhD in economics, I think I'm much better off than those who did an undergrad degree in economics. Because in my opinion, I think under, uh, undergrad degree in actuarial science is probably the best degree you could do. Because when I was doing the MSc in financial economics, oh, and the, the next reason why I chose that MSc is because it was mostly mathematics. There was like one or two theory courses, and you know, I hate theory courses. I like mathematics. Um, but most of the courses were, were it was mathematics. And it was interesting because you're doing an advanced microeconomics course, but it was only mathematics. There's no theory involved in that. We were doing an advanced macroeconomics course as well, and it was all stochastic calculus and more equations and formulas, but there was no theory involved in that. So I think because of that, it made me get, um, angle towards that master's. OK, um, does anyone else have any questions? You can raise your hand or you can just put your mics on or message me. OK, so someone is asking if you can play the video. Oh, what? right, yes. I guess we have time. <laughs> well, I probably should also, should also mention that. Um, wait, is my screen still sharing? Do I need yes. to? Yes. OK, I should also mention that this girl here to the back who was in the same department at me at the central bank. She was a past actual student as well. Right, her name oh. was Shalima. So there's a lot of past actual students that I saw at the central bank. Um, right, so this this video, one of my favorite videos of my degree. Um, we can can't, no. Hold on. How do I share the audio from this? One second. Does anybody know how to share the audio from that? <laughs> Not, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows. Yes, I'm going to try something. Let's see. Are you hearing it? Yeah, I'm hearing you, but not the video. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I'm sure. How to. Uh, Oh, someone said, try to mute your mic and see if it works. Okay. I think you'd have to change the input on um, Microsoft Teams from your mic to whatever is um, playing the video. 
Um, but now give him any the option to change the end on the mic. Yeah, he's he's a um guest, so it won't work for him. Okay, um maybe you can send it to me and yeah. I'll share it with everyone in the club. Yeah, because it's actually on on YouTube, so I will, I will send it to you and you can um, share it to them. I think I saw it. I think it's on the AXA YouTube channel, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. I, I will I will still send it to you because it'll share it to them because I I love that video. <laughs> okay. Um. So thank you for oh, speaking okay. with us and giving us your experiences. Um, up next, we have um, Vanita Mar Maraj, and she graduated in 2019 and currently works as an investment analyst at Answer Merchant Bank. So Vanita, if you, you can go on. Yes, hi everyone, you're here in me, right? We're here. Okay, great. Let me try and share my screen and let me know if you're all seeing it. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, hi, I am Vanessa Maraj and I did this degree at TV and now I work as an investment analyst, which is a bit of a different career path from the people who would have gone into more actuarial type of work or the past two people who did PhDs and stuff, right? So I would just give like, I guess my perspective, which is probably a little different for anyone who it may be relevant to. So I think my screen's stuck. All right, so I would say like, from my personal point of view, you have different components to your career. So one is the degree, getting the actuarial science degree. Another one would be getting work experience, whether it's internships or just any type of experience that you have. And then you would need professional exams, yes, yeah, SOA exams or PRM or all the different kinds of professional exams or postgraduate work that people do. And also your soft skills, which would be, you know, anything that doesn't have to do with all these things with these degrees and work experience and exams you also need like your personality and the way you communicate and your hobbies and those things as well and i think it's a balance of all these things would help you move forward in your career so i i think a lot a mistake that a lot of people make is that they kind of focus on they focus too much on one particular part of these four components. Like a lot of people think like getting the degree, once I have the degree, that's it, I'm gonna get the perfect job. Or once I have my exams, I'll get the perfect job. Or my soft skills, once I network and once I know the right people, that's the main thing I should focus on. Um, so I would say an important thing is to try to have a balance, try to focus on all these things and don't put too much importance on one thing as being the secret sauce to get in where you want to be. So moving on, I would just say like this has been my career journey so far. So I started off in Central Bank as a finance intern in the finance and accounting department. And then I worked as an investment analyst at Anson McCall Head Office Financial Services. Um, I was a senior analyst in capital markets for First Citizens Corporate and Investment Banking Unit. And now I am an investment analyst in private wealth management for Anson Merchant Bank. So I would say, like, if someone was to ask me what is my dream job, it is where I am now in private wealth management. That is something from the moment I started actuarial science, I wanted to work in private wealth management and I got it. So I would say like one thing I believe in is don't settle for anything other than the thing that you know you want the most because nothing else will make you happy until you get that. So I'm very, very happy with where I am right now is a great, great field, I think and I am very proud of where I am. So that being said, I want to say that um, success is not a straight line. And I think like when I was in the position that you all are in now, which is 
doing your degree and attending these um, actuarial seminars and stuff, you hear from a lot of people who are very, very, very successful or they went through the degree and they did very well and they got these amazing lives out of it. And you look at that and you think like, I remember being in your position and thinking, okay, I'm not sure if this applies to me, particularly because, you know, I am not top of the class or head of this club or president of this or anything like that. So how do I fall in or how do I relate to this person's story? So I just want to say, like, sometimes you could see the end result of what's, where someone reached, but you don't really know, like, all the things, the ups and the downs that that person would have gone through to get to that point. So I just thought, like, as we're talking about life in UE and after UE, I would just share my little journey and what it's been like. So um, so I started off actually as an engineer. So I was studying electrical and computer engineering and my journey started back in September 2013. And I dropped out of engineering after two years. Um, I just didn't like it. It really wasn't for me. And I, I also had a lot of friends who did actuarial and they told me about AXA and to try it, maybe I might like it. So I started back UE in 2015. And, you know, AXA, it is a very stressful degree at times. It could be very stressful. It's a great degree. I enjoyed it, but I had a really tough time. Like I failed life guns too. And when I failed, well, I don't know how it is now, but back when I failed, it meant that you have four years. You cannot graduate in three years. You will need to take four years for your degree. And I was so depressed. Like, I cannot even describe how sad that was for me. And I decided, like, you know, I, I was in UE for so long and I wasn't working yet. And everyone was just, everything was passing me by. So I decided like, you know what, in my final year of UE, I'm going to start applying to jobs because I wanted work experience. So I applied to Maritime and Food Citizens and I was rejected. Um, but then I ended up getting my internship at Central Bank. So that was like the first light in my tunnel. And then while I was at Central Bank, I got an offer with Anson Macau and I worked for a year. So I had a year's work experience by the time I graduated. And when I graduated, I did not get first class. In fact, I got lower second class honors. And um, it really didn't affect me, it didn't bother me because I already had what I wanted. I had work experience and I was in the field that I wanted to be in. So I decided, okay, I graduated. Let me look for another job now. And I was rejected from literally every job I applied to. I was rejected from Guardian Asset Management, from RBC, from Citibank. And I was like, okay, this is not, maybe this field is not for me. Like maybe I should go and do something else. Like what should I do? And then it turns out I got into First Citizens, which was the same bank that rejected me in 2018. They actually reached out to me and asked me to join. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. I went to First Citizens and then while I was at First Citizens, I got another offer to rejoin ANSA, but this time in the private wealth management department, which is the department that I always wanted to work in. So, um, the reason I'm sharing this is because I just want people to know, like, the journey will never be easy. It will always be difficult. And sometimes you see people and they have like, they look like they have this perfect life and they have exactly what they want, but that comes with not giving up and knowing when to when to keep moving forward. So, like everything that I said, I guess it it sounds simple, but at the time it would have been very very stressful and very emotional. So, um, if anybody feels that way in this degree right now, I think it's totally normal. I think a lot of people like they get stressed out and they think like okay if i am not at the top of the class i'm not gonna make it and i am here to say that like, that is not true you once you are not willing to give up and once you're willing to fight and apply yourself you will get to where you need to be so next on my agenda not as i've just covered that part is for those of you interested in 
not pursuing the SOA exams or not pursuing like further education and you just want to start your career like maybe you should consider investment management if you're interested in that sort of thing so I just thought like I would speak a little bit about this career path if anybody is interested in pursuing this career path so one of the things that is great about this career is that it is very very diverse so investment management you could be an analyst you could go on to be a portfolio manager a risk manager hedge funds um stockbroker risk analyst work for like carry chris private equity like there are so many different things you could do and the actuarial science degree gives you a really really good base to stand out in this kind of field because i noticed um like if if somebody like an employer has to choose between someone with like a bachelor's in management or finance or econ and someone with the actuarial science degree they would choose the actuarial science person mainly because it's a very quantitative degree but we also do like finance and econ courses as well so i would say having this degree is an advantage and it gives you a good a good foot in the door to um to enter into the investment management field um another thing is that the field is very fascinating so if you're interested in like international relations and like global events and things like that is like it applies to your job every single day so you keep up with these things and you're never bored and no day is the same every single day it will be different and you could be as innovative as you want in your job like there's no set rules of how to do things you do things the way you want to do and i would say like i guess um from what brandon would have said like you should do something that's very satisfying and rewarding to you and i from like my perspective one of the things that's very rewarding in an investment management career is that you are not only getting the satisfaction of helping people like with their retirement funds or helping people set aside money to save for school or for the kids or even businesses or things like that you are also like getting the satisfaction of knowing that you you're making good decisions and you know you using your intelligence to help build up capital markets and help the country develop a little bit so that is that is great i think is a great field if you are a very dynamic person and you could kind of balance both the the kind of quantitative side along with um being personable and being interested in things outside of like maths and finance because it's a very broad very very broad um field so like day to day what you would do if you work in like the investment services is mainly managing client money and a client could be an institutional client or an individual so institutional would be like pension funds insurance like life insurance funds mutual funds so that was my first job my first job was institutional managing pension plans and that was a lot of fun but um now i am with high net worth clients which is even more fun because you you get to really test your strategies and see if you're really good at what you do um now is a very very interesting time to be working in investments because well i guess you all would know keeping up with the markets is a very very crazy time right now very fast paced long working hours but it's great and you could um prepare and monitor investment portfolios so you get to pick the stocks and the bonds and all the investments and put them into a portfolio present it to the client um build financial models so um i know you all do like a excel course that's a, that course will come in handy because you use a lot of vba and modeling techniques um you know i i also agree is good to focus on your coding um luckily because i i did a couple of years of computer engineering before um i i had a good foundation with coding as well 
Um, and then you have to analyze like the overall market. So you're not just zooming in on, on local markets or stocks or bonds or whatever. You're looking at everything that might affect um, markets. Uh, keeping up to date with the news every day. Like sometimes as soon as I wake up, I check the news to know like, OK, what do I expect to be happening in work today? And you have to be very opinionated. So you have because somebody will come and ask you like, where do you think this is going? Where do you think this stock is going? Or where do you think this company is going? Or this economy? And you have to be able to have an opinion. It doesn't have to be 100% right, but once you could justify your opinions, that's good. And be a good communicator. So if you think this sounds like you, then you could consider a, a field, this field as your career. So it is a field where you need professional exams, just like with the SOE exams. So you would either need like um, CFA, which is Chartered Financial Analyst exams, as just three levels. Um, you do one level each year. And with that, you could be a portfolio manager, analyst, work in investment banking, anything like that. Um, another one is called Tile, which is a Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst designation and that is just two levels and I think if you have CFA you could skip one of the levels of Kyle and that is more for like if you want to um, work in a hedge fund or private equity something like that so it's not really relevant in Trinidad but if you want to work in the US is a is a relatively new designation that works well in the US and if you want to be unique there is one called chartered market technician which is more like um reading graphs and charts and very very technical analysis of the stock market um not much people have it so it's, it i guess it could make you marketable if you do have it um a tip i would say is um if you put cfa level one candidate on your resume and you apply to banks and stuff, they, they take you. <laughs> you get an interview at least. And um, if you, as you pass these exams, you usually get like promotions or, you know, if you have CFA level one, you, you get preference for a job over somebody who doesn't have it. So I would say um, this is a alternative part to consider because it is a lot less exams than the SOA exams. Um, it's, in terms of difficulty, I would say it, it is not really that comparable because the SOA exams are very in depth into a couple of topics and the CFA is more like broad, but um, not that in depth into different topics. So I guess it, it depends on what you prefer. And yeah, that's that will be my final in closing and you could feel free to contact me if you want to find out more or you could ask questions now if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have a question because I am looking into this career path. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know um, well, I want to go into risk management. So do you have any advice between on what you have to do to get into that field? So for risk management, I think they have a um, professional exam that they do. I think it's like FRM or something or PRM or an exam like that. So you could probably look into like what designation they have particularly. Um, and like focus on like your elective courses. You could probably look at doing some from the faculty of management. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just like look out for any kind of job that has like a risk management department and try to get in and work in a risk management department. OK, thank you so much. L let me just jump uh, in. Let me just jump in. Definitely. So, so just to address the, the question, 
um, the, the exams that you, as Vanita alluded to, the, the exams that you'd want to do that are related specifically for risk management are the either FRM or PRM, right? So okay, PRM so. from the Professional Risk Managers International Association and FRM is Financial Risk Managers Association. The, the, the exams, the material is basically the same. It, um, whether you do the FRM or the PRM, it, they used to be it used to be one body, but um, okay. there was a schism, uh, so they divided into two bodies. But it's it, either either one is um, is acceptable, and a lot of the material um, on the exams is covered. There are four exams for the PRM, for instance. I actually did the PRM exams, and we have um, we have a couple of graduates who have um, who have done who have completed the PRM exams as well. So a lot of the material is covered um, in your degree. Not 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 all of it, but a lot of it is especially um, is one exam is a math exam, which would be more than covered by what you do in the degree. So just to address that question. Um. OK, thank you so much, sir. Does anyone else have questions? Um. Yes, I have like three questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, how did you find the roles that you applied for? Like were, were they in like paper ads or job boards? Yeah, so what I did is I signed up on Caribbean jobs for job notifications and I specifically put investment roles. Mm -hmm. Those were the only jobs that I wanted to apply to. So I got emails like, and I applied to every single job that I would have gotten. I also use like jobs TT and the same thing. I put a filter to just send me investment analyst roles or, you know, um, investment associate roles and on LinkedIn as well. But I, I do find LinkedIn really had much ads in Trinidad, but Caribbean jobs definitely that's where I saw all the jobs that I applied for. OK, on at each of these jobs, like what were your specific roles like in each company? So like when I was at Central Bank, I was an intern, a finance intern. When I was at Ansel McCall, I was an investment analyst in pension, like pretty pension plans, as well as like business development. So like majors and acquisitions, that kind of stuff. And then when I went to First Citizens, it was, I was a senior analyst in capital markets, corporate and investment banking. So that was the opposite of what I was doing at Ansem Akal. At Ansem Akal, it was buy side. So it was picking investments to put into a pension plan. And at First Citizens, I, I tried the opposite, which is selling investments to people, to pension plans and investment managers. So it was actually like constructing bonds and things for companies and the government and structuring them and selling them, actually calling people and asking, you know, would you like to buy this bond? How did you portfolio that kind of stuff? And then, um, well, currently now I am back on the buy side, but um, doing buying for individual high net worth clients. Oh, interesting. And someone asked like what is your work-life balance and like the stress levels since n not every day is the same and like what does your typical day look like a lot of persons find your job spec like very interesting so you're gonna get a lot of questions yeah no problem um i will be very honest it is very long hours <laughs> like um <laughs> when i was in the institutional side I would probably reach to work like around six, quarter past six a.m. and leave work around maybe half eight, nine, sometimes even 11 o'clock. Um, yeah, it, it, it depends on the day, honestly, but I would say most days it would be like a 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. kind of thing. Um, but it honestly depends because some days you just literally work all day um the easiest day you would if you leave work like 5 p.m that's a really good day that's a really really good day but as rare um it, it's long days is a lot of work especially now in conditions like this 
difficult mm -hmm. to predict conditions, but um, it depends on you and you always have help. You always have a team to to help you if you get in really stressed out, but it, it could be hard to have a balance. And I think I'm lucky because um, of the location of where I work, I my hobby is running. I'm a long distance runner. So I have the Savannah right there. So sometimes I could go for a run and then like finish up work after or um, like sometimes, well back before lockdown, like I could go to movie town and watch a movie and then come back and work and finish work. So like, you know, you could take a little break in between, but um, I would definitely say it is not a easy career path to take. But in terms it, of work-life balance. But it's really interesting and really fun, so. Yeah. Is it like fulfilling, like you enjoy what you do? Definitely, I would say I enjoy it a lot. And I, I think a lot of people in work, even though we we work long hours and stuff, we, we all enjoy it. It's very interesting and um, it, it's nice, especially when, you, you know, you select some investments and you check back on it and you see it doing really well and you're saying wow you know I, I pick a winner I pick something good or you you design a portfolio and it perf it outperforms the market so it performs well so I would say like that that is fulfilling in a way and mm -hmm. another thing that's fulfilling is like when you mm -hmm. help somebody make money or you help them like plan their retirement and I guess it's like, or they, they wanted to save money for to send their children to school or something, and they're like, thank you for it or something. It, it's a nice feeling. And um, even on the other side, like when I was on in the capital market side, I mean, that, that was really nice because that was actually helping develop the, the government and the country. So, you know, you help develop the capital markets and um, help get funding to do different projects that we need. So I, I would say it's a good, a nice field. Um, I have three more questions to ask. So someone wanted to know what exams did you do so far? So right now my exam will be in February. That will be CFA level one. Okay. Yeah, and I did P, but I didn't pass P. I did P when I was in year three, I think. Yeah, so yeah, right now I'm doing CFA level one. Okay, great. Um, Do you seek out your own clients in your job? Well, yeah, technically we do, but um, we have something called wealth managers and they're the kind of salespeople, so they go out and see clients. But um, yeah, like if I have a friend who has money to invest, I'll be like, make sure and invest it with us. But um, we yeah. have specific people who, who do the role of seeking out clients and we just plan the portfolios for them and present it to them. Okay, um, I know you have talked about coding, so um, besides Excel, what languages or software do you use? So currently we don't use any software besides Excel, but I would say it would be helpful to use Python um, to help automate things. And VBA especially would help you with your spreadsheets in Excel, but like right now we use a lot of Excel. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. No probs. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Hi, okay. Um. I noticed you when you had your little timeline of how you went about everything after you feel and all of that, right? Um, the part where you had your internship and in, I think it was Central Bank, you said probably like the same year, a year later, 
they offered you a year to work even though you weren't gradu- you weren't graduated yet. Um, what do you think made you stand out? What was your application that made you stand out and all of that? Okay, so I think one thing that made me stand out is I when I was in year three, I joined LinkedIn and I started posting a lot of my own opinions on things happening in the financial markets. And I started trying to network, like trying to connect with people in companies that I wanted to work at. And um, someone actually reached out to me, an executive at Answer Macal, and said that they have an opening for investment analysts and if I would be interested in applying. So I told them, yeah, but that I don't have my degree yet. And they said, um, you know, they, no problem, you could work and study. So I thought that was perfect. And um, I, I applied for the position and I got it. So I think, and I, I did notice like my coworkers as well were people who, um, they post a lot of their own opinions on things or they give a lot of their own insight on things to kind of stand out. So, I mean, I, I would recommend doing that or like if you interview in somewhere, like you would always get asked, like, what do you think about some situation going on or where do you see this situation going? And you kind of have to have your own way of thinking about it and your own opinion. Um, Another thing too is these interviews are always exams. So you have to pass the exam to get the interview. So I I would say it's kind of knowing the two, knowing your theory and knowing how to express yourself. Okay, so this required a lot of research because obviously um, in the, well in the degree they would not have gone in depth and everything, so you would have been researching on your own. Yeah, um, I guess I, I always had an interest in it. I actually did my elective in investment analysis with the finance department, UE management department. So that course gave me a lot of insight into the things needed to pass interviews in investments. And um, yeah, I think it's just like keeping up with the news and knowing when things happen and like for instance, like let's say you share an article about Bitcoin, you could give your own opinion. Like, what do you think of blockchain? Where do you see it going? Do you agree with it as an investment or not? You know, and then people who who interested in hearing about these things, they might reach out to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, a lot of persons are messaging me saying that your story is very interesting and they they really enjoy like what you're doing. So um, we're running a bit behind schedule. So if you guys have any more questions, you can email her. I'll send her email in our group chat. Um, if you don't mind, Benito. Yeah, that's no problem. Yeah. Um, so up next, we have Zachary Borrell. Um, he graduated in 2016 and is currently a loan and processing analyst at Citibank. So, um, hi guys. Hi. Yeah, everyone hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, I may not have been as prepared as the others um, and my career path um, I think for me has been pretty um, pretty plain compared um, so what do I do I'll start off with what I do at City so um, to kind of summarize it I do a lot of preparing and checking reports um, in the field of uh, market support so that's the department that I am in. 
So what we would usually help out a lot with is like FX um, transactions um, in terms of when we the company would buy and sell bonds, right? As well as reporting to the central bank. Um, so those would be like regulatory report. We would do a lot of those, um, a lot of those. And it's mainly a, a job where you come in and you have a list of, of things to do for the day, um, of reports, and you generate all these different things. So it it's not as um, highly technical as others uh, or as the title may see, right? So don't be dissuaded by the analyst title, um, at least in my part, in my view. And um, yeah, so that's more or less what I do for the, uh, do as my job, right? Um, in terms of my UE experience, um, similar to a lot of people, I did not know what actuarial science was before I got into it. Um, I only knew about it around Form 6 when I realized that I'm really good in math and um, I was good in accounting. And I said that I didn't want to do just a math degree. So actuarial had recently came out. I decided that I would choose that as, uh, as something I would put forward to. Um, when I got in, um, I would have been exposed to the uh, full knowledge of what the profession is all about and how that would, um, what you would need to do to succeed. And the amount of exams, I, I would say, kind of scared me off of it. Um, so I did not pursue that, uh, that career path, right? And in terms of, of what I would have done um, as my career path, um, I would have done a lot of, I would have done internships in um, National Petroleum. Again, nothing really um, actuarial related, but good office experience, um, which is always necessary for um, stepping into the work life after school, right? And after UE, right? I decided that I didn't need to apply for a job right away, that I should have relaxed a bit. And um, that was a bit of a mistake, as it did take some time to get a job afterwards. Um, not relatively long compared to some other people I know, but about six months without a job um, after applying. So it does get a bit tough, right? But luckily, I landed a job at Scotia Bank um, in one of their back offices. They had a position as a collections um, officer, right? Um, so what it was is mostly me working in a call center, and I would have then dealt with more late stage collection. So that job, though, would have taught me a lot of uh, things to deal with day to day banking as well as how loans um, are viewed and worked, as well as delinquency. Um, I would have known a lot more about um, credit cards. So it was insightful um, in terms of real life experience. It was also um, insightful in terms of working with people. And um, yeah, so that was that was really well. Um, I ended up being an acting supervisor in the department and um, that's when I leveraged that position to get into Citibank. So I would have only recently transitioned into Citibank um, as at me this year, right? And um, from there it really was that what I'm doing right now, right? So, so as I said, it's a felt relatively short career path for me. Right. Um, in terms of what I would consider um, was my success in where I am right now, it would be that the degree was a major asset. As most people, when they hear about the actuarial science degree, they know that it is a tough degree and that coming out of it with, um, with just finishing the degree is an accomplishment and that shows that you can work hard, right? 
And um, as well as Vinita would have mentioned, um, I am pursuing the CFA. Um, I would have put as on my resume pursuing as a CFA candidate. I did write the exam last year. Unfortunately, I did not pass. Um, the topics really were broad and I can speak more about that if people would like some insight on that. I can speak about that after. Right. Um, another success of mine would have been to have confidence in your ability, especially when you go into an interview. You need to be able to convey and convince that person that they are picking you um, for the right reason that you can deliver um, on the job. Right. And once you have that confidence, it is something that um, that will be conveyed and, and you will stand out from there. Right. Um, as in terms of my advice, in terms of while you are in the program, I would say try your best not to stress over it. Right. I know it is a difficult program and it is something that is um, that is quite challenging. And um, when it comes to electives, I would suggest probably try to have a balance of picking things that could possibly help you in terms of what career path you might want to go into. So I would have picked more finance courses to try and get more understanding of that, which did help. But I also would have picked um, one or two regular um, courses that were more for my personal growth, like um, we did. I did ethics and I found it was a very wonderful course that um, made me that had a, it was full of insight and was a very um, key part of my personal growth, right? As well as ethics is something that you uh, need to have in the financial industry as um, fraud is a big, um, a big factor in a lot of, of companies you go to and having a high ethical standard is um, is an asset to have. Right. Um, well, that's more or less it in terms of my life after UE. Right. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has anything else they would like to uh, any questions at this time, I should say. Um, I'm free to answer anything. Um, is anyone speaking? No, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if anyone has any questions. Someone asks, um, which exams did you do? So I would have only um, done these CFA exams, um, level one. Uh, I didn't pursue any of the actuarial um, exams. Okay. And one other person asked what are some types of questions they ask in interviews? So in terms of with interviews. Right, so a lot of interview questions are more situational type of questions. Um, like what would you see yourself doing if a certain scenario comes up? So I guess my most recent interview would have been with Citibank and um, many questions were uh, what would happen if it is that you have a delivery report that has a, uh, a deadline, right? But you're not getting any support from your teammates. What would you do in that scenario? And I believe my answer would have been more along the lines of um, I'll try to network as much as possible um, outside of your team, if it is a team cannot support, um, as well as you would have to leverage on your manager as well that um, definitely get the support you need and don't be afraid to really um, force that communication among your teammates that um, to convey for the overall goal that you need to get this done. 
Okay, thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming out today and telling us your experiences. No problem. Yeah. So our final speaker today would be um, Ms. Tony Marie Bobat, ASA Sarah. Tony is currently an associate actuary at KR Services. She graduated in 2015 and is currently on track to become an FSA soon. And she might possibly be the first to have graduated from the UE program. So, Tony. Hi, everyone. Um, so, as Caitlin mentioned, I have pursued the actuarial science beyond UE. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint per se, but I guess I will speak a bit about my role as an actuary in my current um, job, which is in a consultant firm. And I guess I could give some background on the exams as well as other potential job opportunities that there might be in the market for those who would be interested in pursuing actuarial science as a career beyond UE. So um, I guess my main motivation for choosing actuarial science was I have a deep love for math and I mean, I knew I didn't want to do engineering or anything with business or science. And when I first heard about actuarial science, that I was at form five and I was at the point of choosing A level subjects to decide, you know, do I commit to doing engineering or um, what? So I did applied math, math and physics for A-levels, and I applied to UE for the AXI program. Um, and then I guess year one was a bit of a, I wouldn't really consider that um, actuarial science as it was more introductory math courses. Um, but from year two, I would say it was where the real challenge began. And it was a very humbling experience because coming out of A-levels and O-levels where, you know, like if you were somewhat of an overachiever and you are used to getting distinctions, I think coming into this program, you had to adjust your expectations because it was a very difficult transition. And some of the courses, you know, you're not used especially me who, who did never had any um, business or accounting or any sort of experience because I have done sciences um, for all levels. So I was coming into this fresh. So it was a very um, humbling experience, but um, I pushed through and eventually I think I did pretty well. I graduated with upper second class honors and I was under a government scholarship. So I after I graduated, I worked at Unitrust in their investment department for about six months. And during that time, I was applying um, to jobs. I was just sending my resume out um, to insurance companies, anyone that I knew from before. And it was actually in February 2016 when um, I think between UE and KR, they hosted um, the networking event at La Cantina where I met my current employer, Kyle, and um, well, I guess from there was where I kind of got um, my foot in partially because I think this goes without saying that interpersonal skills um, go a long way. And I think the value of networking and talking to people, I mean, that was a really big um, Thing for me because at that point I knew I didn't know much people in the room beyond um, the few people who I did go to UE with who were there and um, I think having that experience was really good because it kind of geared you up for what's to come because in consulting a lot of what you do is talking with people and um, you had you had to had to kind of break the ice from early on and um, so I currently work in the non-life department at KR Consulting and we do a bit of general insurance as well as a little bit of life work. It's called a non-life department because it's not strictly life, it's not pension, so everything else that doesn't fit into those um, too strict, I guess, rules comes to us. 
And it is a very fulfilling um, career in that you get exposed to a lot of different types of work. So a typical, I wouldn't say day, but a typical month, let's say, um, we would get product development work, we would get pricing work, there would be quarterly valuations, not, that's not really something we do monthly. And um, so as you know, with the market, I mean, there are a lot of insurance companies and as it becomes more saturated, companies would want to try to change their product to, man to maintain their competitiveness and to stand out. So when they do that, they would come to us to help them price or to determine what's the best mix of um, product features they could put in at, you know, to still maintain their competitiveness, because obviously some of the things they may want to add, they <laughs> cannot charge for it because it won't be competitive. And I mean, that's always a very, um, I think that was one, that that is one of my favorite things to do and that it's very new it's never the same and you have to do a lot of research into what's currently in the market what do other competitors price um, charge for it you know what's available in the global market to try to get ideas to see what they could possibly build into their product um, then we do routine pricing work um, so every year some contracts are annually renewable so if um let's say one year they had really bad experience and that they had a lot of claims and their premiums could no longer support the level of claims that they're getting they would come to us to ask us like you know how do we reprice this should we let it ride um and look at it again next year so a lot of that involves um analysis, you would have to collect the historical data, do projections and see whether the losses were as a result of a one off event or whether it's a trend that you expect to continue in the future. Um, we also do a lot of advice work um, for clients in terms of preparing financial statements. We do projections for their budget um, and a lot of that involves developing assumptions from scratch and I guess one of the unique things I guess would work in Trinidad, well, I guess in the Caribbean or any developing country on a whole, is that the work that you would do never really follows the textbook strictly. Um, a lot of it is new in that the data sets that you get would not be these big large data sets that, you know, someone in the US could just do, um, slap it into a software and they would get numbers. A lot of it is that you have to sift through and find the trends yourself and build the models from scratch. And I think that is a very excellent skill that um, working in actuarial science has taught me in terms of building models. And I actually um, was one of the first people to do the predictive analytics exam from the SOA. And I definitely think the work experience that I had helped me in that exam because um, writing the report, I mean, as you know, life never goes according to plan. So in the exam, um, you had this large data set, I think it was around 50,000 <laughs> rows of data, and you had about five hours to um, build the model that was specified in the question and then write a report on it. And my model didn't work. It, the data set was so large it crashed the computer for a while um, but I think knowing how to understand the data and to walk through all that you have done which is something that you gain from work experience and I guess just being able to express yourself clearly was what helped me write a report compelling enough to pass because I understood why the model didn't work I understand the problems that it had so I think that was something very useful that um, my work experience has taught me. Um, and I guess now with the whole virtual work environment, there will be a lot more opportunities for work, as I have seen um, from emails that headhunters send out that, you know, there are re remote work opportunities. So now you're not just bounded so you could only look at Trinidad, for instance. I mean, th there would be a lot more opportunities as well as with the new insurance act that um, has been passed, but I don't think it's 
yet come into effect, but um, previously general insurance companies were not required to have actuarial evaluations done by law. But now I think with this new act, general insurance companies would be required to have an actuary perform a valuation for them. And by valuation, I mean um, calculation of reserves. So um, I guess in a nutshell what that is, so insurance companies, both life and general, they write policies and by nature, the general insurance contracts are annually renewable in most instances. There may be a few of them like equipment's compensation, which could run a little longer, but like motor policies, for instance, those are annual. And um, so each year, I guess they write policies and they have claims that would come in, but it's not a one in one out instance and in that a claim comes in and it, get pay, it gets paid out at um, one time. Sometimes these um, claims could be on the books for years, either if there was a death involved, for instance, those things generally take a while to investigate. And um, if it goes before the courts, it takes longer and then the amounts that they could settle for could be much larger than what was um, on the policy. So a lot of factors would play into why an insurance company would need to set up a fund. So us as the actuary, we would look at their loss experience for like the last 10 years and we would look at the settlement patterns of claims. So, so, so we sort of see like the average time it would take to pay out a claim. And then we also try to segment the claims between whether it was a third party a fully comprehensive because those by nature have very different patterns because third party tends to be smaller claim amounts, but more frequent fully comprehensive on the other hand would be larger amounts, but less frequent and where possible when the data permits. We also try to segment where it was a bodily injury, which would involve um, persons or death or whether it was property damage, which was just like a fender bender or anything, because all of that would determine, I guess, how do you um, allocate funds to the different types? Um, so that would generally be re what reserving is, setting up um, a fund for claims which have been incurred but not yet reported. I don't know if you guys might have come across that term in any reading. It's called IBNR. But um, so that is one of the primary work we do for general insurance companies currently, which is reserving. And then on the life insurance side, they set up reserves, but that but that is not IBNR. So when you write a life insurance policy, it could go for life like 30, 40, 50 years. So they set up a policy, um, a reserve at inception for those policies. Um, generally, um, they use the access software, which some of you may have um, gotten exposure to at UE, I believe, if um, the lab still does the um, course or the project or whatever it was, I can't remember. <laughs> but yeah, so and, and um, so using access is a great skill to learn if um, that would come in handy um, in future. Um, and I guess with exams now, I guess that would be the last thing I, I would touch on. So I did pursue the exams. My first exam that I wrote was when I was in my third year in UE, so October 2014. I was just doing it just to try it. I had no expectations. I wrote FM. I didn't pass. I got a five, which wasn't too bad for a first try. And then I the following year I rewrote it and I really haven't stopped since. So since October 2014 to now I've been writing exams and I think, I mean, the biggest thing is coming to terms with failure. I mean, no one really likes to fail, but there's a lot of it. Well, if you're lucky, there won't be, but I mean, the average person has some failures and um, hurdles to get over. So for instance, um, the financial economics exam, I had to write that three times to pass, which was, I think, I, at, the, at the third time I thought if I didn't pass it, I might reconsider whether I wanted to continue or not. But, you know, I got over that hump and then pretty much after that, it's been fairly smooth sailing because I think you kind of get into the groove of, you know, what studying technique works best for you and what doesn't. 
And then I guess the other big thing to balance is the work life study. Um, like, how do you do that? Because most times, like, so most times I would be working five days a week. And yes, we do have a study support program. And most companies who hire actuarial um, students or persons who graduated and from the XI program or whatever else, they would offer them a study support program. But I mean, so in my instance, we get 20 days every six months. And depending on what you do, you could choose, I mean, once it fits into the grander schedule at work, you could allocate those days as you would like. So, but you're basically working full time and the hours aren't like clear cut. Some days you could work until 9 p.m. Some days, uh, you know, and less where you're just so tired, you don't want to study. So I think really finding that balance and not every, not the same things won't work for the same person. So for instance, I, I would have tried to have a strong cutoff time at 5 p.m. That would have been my latest and between 7 to 10 on an evening that would have been my study time. And I think definitely keeping a consistent schedule was was what helped me stay on track because I think if I played it by air and um, I would have kind of lost the drive to keep pushing at it. So you definitely have to have the discipline to make it through these exams because by no means are they easy. Um, and as Caitlin mentioned, I am on track to be, I am on track to becoming a fellow. This week I wrote my third fellowship exam, which if all goes well, might hopefully be the last, but I mean, that's yet to be determined, but um, yeah, so I guess that is a bit about a role of an actuary in the consulting field. That pers I can't really speak too much of what it's like on, a, on the inside of an insurance company. That may be more, um, it may not be as diverse in that you don't get to work with a broad variety of clients because as it's just your company that you're working for. But I think consulting is a great field because you get exposed to not just insurance companies, but you get to do work for banks, um, the government in some instances. And it's really fulfilling because you know that the work that you do, it affects not just the company, but it affects the policyholder as well. And you try to, it makes you see things fairly and that you know you're not just going because people always think insurance companies are just out there for the money but I think you as the actuary you are an impartial third party so that when you're doing the work you could set things fairly and even the playing field so that the policyholders interests are protected as well so if anyone has any questions I would be glad to answer Yes, um, firstly, I'd like to say um, thank you for sharing with us that you failed your first exam. Like that kind of gives me some hope because most actuaries we speak to or who speak to us, they're always like, yeah, I wrote the exam, I passed it, um, it was that, and I just did all and I just became an actuary just like that. So that really gives me hope. <laughs> and also my question is, um, how long did it take you to become an ASA? OK, so while well, I took my first exam in October 2014 and I didn't become an ASA until April 2019. So about five years, about four and a half to five years, maybe. Um, but I mean, again, in there, there were the hurdles of having to do the new predictive analytics exam. <laughs> so and the, in, in between there, there were some failures as I failed the MFE, which was, I guess, I, I don't know what they call it now, which, which is the financial economics exam. I failed that twice. And I also failed life contingencies once. Um, I got a zero on that. So I'm sure that that may be motivation to some people. Um, this, I mean, after seeing that, you might be very discouraged. But I mean, um, you know, once you stick at it and have the discipline and um, if it's something, I mean, you have to really love it to stick to it, to be honest, because if you're just in it because you think it's money or you think, you know, it's this 
fancy sound in Korea, you're not going to make it very far because after a while you'll realize that the countless hours of sacrifice, and I mean it's a lot of sacrifice to work, let's say, eight to ten hours on average, and then study for a couple more, you'll realize that you can't do that for anything else out of pure passion. Mm -hmm. And um, Mr. Smart told us that you unfortunately got a positive test for COVID while studying for the exam that you had this week. How no, no, what was the exam I had in July? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So how was that like studying while being sick? Like what kept you motivated? Well, I well, the exam was originally scheduled for April and I tested positive in March. And at that time, they hadn't yet rescheduled the exam for July. Um, so at that point, you know, I, I mean, apart from being sick, I was kind of down and out about, you know, I would not be on like, you know, my schedule is off all because I was studying since January for this thing. Um, I was kind of disheartened about that. But then thankfully, when they announced that they rescheduled it for July, I felt like there was some hope. So I was in the hospital for three weeks. But I mean, the toll of that, I mean, it took a toll on my body and my mind. Um, I didn't actually start back to study until June, just because um, after I returned to work, it took me a while to, I mean, I was tired all the time. I just couldn't focus. There were a lot of um, lingering effects from COVID, I guess, that prevented me from pushing my body as hard as I needed to to study. So it wasn't until June. So I basically stopped studying mid-March or maybe early March and I didn't start back until June and, other, and at that time I basically had to revisit everything that I had done before because I think at that point your mind is kind of wiped from what it had read so many months before and I mean it was, it was just sheer determination I think that pushed me through um, yeah. a month and a half to prepare for this exam which by um, I'm sure many of you might may have heard horror stories about what these fellowship exams may be. And it was a very difficult experience writing it. Um, more so because I, I didn't feel like I was 100% as prepared as I could have been because I had to leave out some topics in the month and a half that I had. So I was just um, maximum effort and I guess it's the passion for it. Yeah, I, I just knew that some way or the other I had to do it. Mm -hmm. And how on average, like for each, well, for ASA exams, like on average, how many months did you study for each one? Um, Like three to four months, I would say, but that's what working full time. Um, I think, it, I mean, if you're not working, it could perhaps be done in, in less time. I mean, each each individual it may vary from, but for me, I think three to four months is sufficient. Um, like, so even if you're in school, I would suppose that would be equivalent to having a full time job if you have the classes all day. So I think three to four months and it kind of works out with the schedule of exams and that they have them. I think the preliminary exams, the ASA, they have them about three times for the year, yeah. if that's still the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. yeah. Tyrese, you had a question? Yeah, so um, if we decide to like work while um, but after our degree, right? How tedious it is like working and doing the exam, but, but preparing for the exam. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't sugarcoat it. I think so when you now start a job, obviously it's you don't have as much responsibilities and it is a little easier to pass the exams or to study for them. Um, in the first year and a half or so, but I think once you become fully involved in your work role and you get a lot more responsibility and your hours get longer, which they most likely would, it becomes a lot more difficult. And even if you finish work early, some days your mind is just so tired and exhausted that, you know, you just can't make it to study. So it is about finding a balance that works for you and it is very exhausting 
on at times, but at the end of the day, it is more rewarding than it is exhausting. So you just have to look at the goal that you want to achieve. And if it is something that you want, you work hard and you get it because you just have to push through those couple of months of discomfort. And um, I think mo most so my company, as well as most others that I'm aware of, they do increase your salary each exam you pass. So, I mean, that is also something to work towards um, that gives you a little extra motivation to study. Right, I will have two more questions, right? Sure. How, well, from your experience, doing this degree, right, how much did it take from your social life and from the interaction with family members and stuff? And so also, how oh, sorry. does it keep saying? Okay, well, I'll answer that question first. Um, so while I was at UE, I, I don't think it took away too much from my social life or from my family. I mean, the courses were difficult, yes, but I mean, you, you had times where you didn't, you didn't have classes all day and you could have done your assignments during the, in between the classes or whatnot. I mean, finals are final, sure. <laughs> then you're kind of locked in your room and you're studying. But generally throughout the degree, um, I was able to maintain a fairly good balance. Um, but I guess that balance is a little more difficult to maintain after UE. That's, I mean, you kind of have to sacrifice a little bit temporarily, of course. Um, so family time and social life kind of gets put on the back burner because, I mean, these, it would it would really it really requires a hundred percent of you to get through it. And what was your other question? Any other questions? Yeah, I'm um, sorry about that. And the other question, right? How the economy is now, right? Presently, with the whole COVID situation. And you know, the likelihood of us getting a job is kind of small, right? What advice could you give us to like better place ourselves at a, better, at a good position to like get a job or like to earn money? Okay, well, I mean, okay, well, I, I could only speak from, I guess, an actuarial, well, if you're pursuing that. Um, so, yes, the economy may be headed towards a very bad place, but there are a lot of, you might actually be surprised because in the last two weeks, um, so actually when I got my ASA um, from those lists that SOE publishes, a lot of these um, headhunting companies, they find you on LinkedIn or they find you well, I guess you would have to have a LinkedIn. So that, that's an, another important point is to build your social presence because, I mean, companies can not find you or you can't find companies if you're not out there. So I think having a very good LinkedIn page and to follow a lot of people in the industry that you may want to get into is a very helpful point, first of all. Um, but there actually are um, opportunities for jobs. Um, I have, so in the last two weeks, I got emails where um, global companies are setting up operations um, like Bermuda, Cayman Islands and whatever and they have re remote work opportunities so and part of how you get in, into or like knowing these things is through LinkedIn so like Oliver Wyman I think they're one company who does headhunting um, and then there may be a couple others that I can't recall off the top of my head. So, I mean, if you create a LinkedIn page, you could follow these companies or you could follow um, like key people in like Trinidad, let's say, like their post comments, just kind of get your name out there and also take in exams in whichever field, whether it be CFA, SOA, or whichever path you decide to go on, I mean, any time that you're waiting to get a job, I mean, these exams could only make you more marketable. I mean, it does help you get your foot in the door, I could tell you that. But I mean, again, having the interpersonal skills and communication 
is what would seal the deal because I mean, yes, you could have all this on paper, but I mean, it's your personal skills that would eventually get you the job. I, I just I, I just wanted to address one of the things uh, that the, the with, with regards to the last question where um, the person that asked it uh, was suggesting that the probability of getting a job now is is, is bad or very low. Uh, that's not necessarily the case for people coming out with actual science degrees. Uh, in the last two weeks, three people that graduated from our program got um, jobs at Sagico in the same um, in the same department. They were hired simultaneously, and I know of other graduates from uh, this year. Uh, when I say this year, would have finished school, you know, in uh, in in well, uh, would have graduated in October. Uh, I know of a couple other people that got jobs because I was there. The, they used me as references and such. Uh, one person had a job at Maritime. So um, to suggest that uh, the probability of getting a job is, is you know, is, is particularly bad. Well, uh, maybe if you don't have a degree in actual science. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, um, we can move on to Mr. Smart. Oh, sorry, one question. Lisa? Oh, yeah, I had a question. Um, so last year I did an internship in Pan American and I observed the actuaries there. They had a the post of assistant actuary, right? So I'm assuming that in most insurance companies they have the post well i guess the main actuary and then the assistant actuaries is that because of the exams themselves or um experience i was wondering if on your way of moving up was it mainly because of the exams or how long you worked or however um you're referring to like the designation that they call like assistant actuary or if that's what you mean or yeah, they had the post of assistant actually, like on their desk, they had it there. Okay, well, technically to call yourself an actuary, I suppose you would have to have either an ESA or FSA designation from the Society of Actuaries. But um, the name and conventions vary by company, to be honest. So when I first started off, I was actuarial analyst. And um, I guess my title changed when I, beca when I became an associate, but um, to be honest, work rules vary. Um, yes, I mean, you can have exams and still not move up. I think so. Yes, exams do help you move up, but it's also the experience and um, performance that helps you move up. But in terms of what you call yourself, I mean, I guess that does vary from company to company. Um, but you, I guess in some instances, you could be, I guess, the assistant actuary may be equivalent to an actuarial analyst somewhere else, but um, I get, to be an actuary, you would have to have the designation from the society or any other um, body who offers the actuarial exams. OK, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you, Tony, for giving us such an insightful look into what an actuary does and for talking about your experiences and whatnot. So thank you for coming out today. Um, Mr. Smart, do you have anything to say? Yeah, so um, well, I'm just going to have some uh, closing remarks uh, before we wrap things up today. It's been a, it's been a very uh, insightful um, uh, and um, information packed two hours. Um, you know, uh, when you all first start uh, on the first, uh, in your first year, on the in the first week that you're at UV, uh, we do our ori orientation um, session. And, um, you know, I give more or less the same um, sort of speech where uh, I talk about the fact that the degree, this degree in actual science, it's not necessarily meant only to produce 
professional actuaries, people who get the designations, who write the exams and become associates and fellows, as, as in the case with, uh, with Tony. Uh, the degree is meant to give you a, such, uh, a solid foundation so that it prepares you to, be, uh, uh, to, to raise the level of what is expected from professionals uh, in the wider uh, financial services sector um, and beyond. Uh, our panel of speakers today um, provide empirical evidence of the fact that the degree is doing what it was designed to do. I mean, today we had uh, five speakers, uh, a, a statistician, whose uh, work has applications in entertainment, in medicine, in education, in ag agriculture, uh, and as Brendan. We had um, Shane, who has, um, who's, who has expertise, who's an economist with expertise in, uh, in, in cyber crime. Uh, we've had a, an investment professional um, uh, with young Vanita there. We've had a banker, and then of course we have uh, uh, Tony, who is a professional actuary. So um, in those five speakers, we have quite a, a bit of diversity. Um, you know, every, every single one of them is doing something completely, uh, you know, quite, quite different from um, what, uh, well, with, with, with the exception of Tony, that they have roles that do not follow the traditional path of, uh, of what an actuary would do. But that's fine because, uh, you know, there won't be, uh, there aren't necessarily uh, enough actuarial jobs for all of the people graduating from the program, but that's okay because they, with the degree, there are so many other jobs that you can you you would be qualified for, and it comes back to um, I, I gave um, at the last conference at the last CAA conference uh, Caribbean Actuarial Associations uh, conference, which was in Curacao. Um, I was involved with, uh, where I gave with a, with a presentation. Uh, um, titled The Anythingness of Actuarial Science. And in that I gave, um, you know, um, a lot of instances where application, uh, actuarial science can be applied uh, in instances that, you, that, that you know, you wouldn't traditionally think um, uh, an actuary could bring, the, or, or someone with actuarial training or, the, with, or an actuarial degree can bring their skill set to, um, oh, sorry, I should have turned my camera on. Uh, uh, would have brought their skill sets to uh, uh, to add value um, um, in, in a variety of different applications and in, in, uh, in the wider financial services sector and beyond. So um, uh, on that note, uh, I want to thank uh, our speakers again, our five speakers, Brendan, Shane, uh, Vanita, Zach and Tony. Uh, for taking the cat time to to uh, uh, come out and to to, to speak to us, uh, speak to you guys, uh, and provide you know um, some uh, uh, inspiration uh, for what uh, you can do um, uh, with a degree in actual science. And um, and you know the question really is what you can do, but but is there anything that you cannot do? Uh, I would say. Um, so on that note, yeah, I would like to say thanks again. Round of applause um, uh, for our speakers, and um, uh, thank you very much to the um, the executive of the Actual Science Club for organizing uh, such uh, um, um, uh, I think a very uh, a great uh, event. I think it's the first, it is the first time we put something on uh, like this, uh, and I think I think it's gone across very well. In fact, um, I know um, I spoke to the dean a few days ago um, on, on other matters, but this came up. And um, uh, he, uh, the university is interested in, um, in um, I think, uh, taking what we've done here today, uh, because I know it's been recorded, and um, posting it on, uh, on a university, um, one of the university websites and whatnot. But we'll uh, talk more to, about that um, uh, to, um, to the executive uh, once this is done. So again, thank you very much. And um, I will let uh, um, Madam President, uh, uh, have um, have uh, some final words on, on today. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Smart. So, um, everyone who is who spoke today, Brandon, Shane, Zachary, Vanessa, Tony, they all went in different career paths. They all had different life experiences but one thing that i took away from this was 
they all have a passion, found their passion for what they're doing. And they may have failed at certain things in the beginning, but they found their success and now they're pursuing something that they love. And that resonates with me. So thank you everyone for coming out today, especially our guest speakers. Um, and I hope we can do something like this again. Hopefully, like with all of us being there in person and not over a screen. And again, thank you all for coming out today. And yeah, I don't know if any of the other executives have anything to say or add. I just want to reiterate the fact that hearing these different experiences gives me hope and I hope it gives a lot of our members hope as well that we don't feel stuck in pursuing different career paths or if we're unsure about pursuing the actual science career path we know that there are many options so I'd like to thank all the guests and I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and I wish everyone good health and strength and hope you all keep safe during these difficult times. Okay, so again, thank you everyone for coming out and I'm going to end the meeting now. So, bye.